So, hello. It's on right. I'm David Porfox, Managing Director at uh, Massive Entertainment, which is a Ubisoft studio since 2008. I absolutely loved my university, as opposed to Pauline. <laughs> um, I'm going to find the clicker. Here we go. So, what are we going to talk about today? Well, uh, games are about uh, people, really. And for different reasons, we have both ended up in positions where we manage people. And of course, we spend a lot of our time thinking about how to manage people well and to get the right results. So today we're going to talk about that, managing the creative people. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how we got our jobs. I, I think most of you already have your dream jobs, so maybe you don't need to know how we got ours. This is me in my office. What do I do all day? We'll talk a little bit about that. And then uh, finally, some of our uh, biggest failures which is, of course, really embarrassing, but we decided to, uh, to go there anyway. And hopefully this is not streamed online so anybody would hear, right? Uh, first of all, a disclaimer. Um, I hate it when people tell me what to do uh, or when people think they should lecture me. Uh, so I like to find things out for myself and I like to learn the hard way. So I'm not really comfortable being on stage and telling other people uh, anything that they should be doing. And I hate cults. And I think Pauline is a bit the same, that we don't necessarily feel that we should tell other people what to do. So this is not a speech about that. This is... We're prepared to do this, so we'll do it. Yep. Yeah. But we, uh, so think of, think of this as um, two journeys that uh, it's like a short biography of two other people in the game industry. And then you can make up your own mind if there's anything there that you want to learn from or not. Okay, looking back then. Uh, that's me as a kid. I'm half Italian, so this is from Sardinia. My father is Swedish. I, uh, today I am a boss. But that's actually me there in art school, painting the blue guy. And um, if I look back, uh, I became a manager by accident. It was not the result of a clever plan or a very ambitious uh, idea that I had. Uh, when I was young, I was the guy, you know, there was always a person in the back of the classroom who was sitting and drawing on the uh, bench. That was me. I was doing cartoons all day and didn't really pay attention to what the teachers were saying because I already knew that I would be either a uh, poor uh, rock star or a poor and suicidal artist. So I was pretty happy with that. And I moved on. I uh, followed that dream. I went to uh, one of Sweden's best art schools which is called Konstfak. It's based on the Bauhaus tradition. Uh, really, really, truly great place. Five years of uh, having fun and being very experimental with no prospect to make any money ever. I got a master's degree, which I'm really proud of. I know how to make a marble sculpture if you need one. I also need to do know how to make really, really fancy copper prints, which is one of the most rewarding things you can do in life. The smell and the feeling, it's very tactile. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. Uh, and I had no plans at this time to become uh, involved in any type of business or any type of management. And I remember one night I went out with my friends from art school and we talked about uh, what, what did you do before you came to art school? And somebody had been in a cafe as a waiter or somebody had been doing dishes and I'd been in a hospital for old people. And we had a lot of, you know, not very, very intellectually challenging jobs. And then somebody said, yeah, but do you remember having a good boss? Nope. None of us could think of anyone who had had a good boss, or even heard about a good boss. And then we asked ourselves, well, what do they do all day in that case? Because they're apparently there in the office, but they're not doing anything that is useful to us. So what do they do? And we thought we were smart people, but at that time and that evening, we couldn't figure out what managers do at all. So that's where I come from. Pauline. Yeah, the contrary to David, I was a, a brilliant pupil. Mm -hmm. uh, I was sitting on the front. I was answering all the questions. Um, uh, at that time, I think bosses for me were people who had knowledge rather than power. It was more like kind of the university type. Um, so, so I went to this horrendous business school um, and I remember the very first day, everybody was gathered and the sorry. dean, oh yeah, sorry, the dean of the, the, that's me in a dress, that's the first and last time you're going to see me in a dress. Um, <laughs> So first day, um, everybody's gathered, the dean of the university is coming, and instead of explaining us what's the culture of the school, uh, instead of explaining us maybe that we should help each other because, you know, it's, it's very tough, uh, he told us, you are the elite of the country. And I was 19, and, I, you know, I was not finished, so uh, I had no idea that the, the working meant 
like climbing the food chain. So I decided to, I, I left the amphitheater and so I decided to not become a boss and just be nice and try to have fun uh, at work. <laughs> and I think that's you, yeah. So how did you become a manager? We'll have this rite of passage, thank you. <laughs> uh, so I was uh, back in Sweden then. I'd just gotten my degree at art school and I was living my life uh, exactly as planned. I was in a shitty studio in a cellar with poor lighting and I was making paintings and illustrations and a bit of graphic design. And I think that I had actually no prospects to go anywhere. And I was perfectly satisfied. I thought that was my dream job. And I think I was 25, 24. And I thought, that's great. I've done it. I can, keep, I can stay in the cellar until I'm 65. Uh, but then, you know how things uh, happen. Uh, life happened to me. I had a girlfriend at the time, and she was a waitress. And she lost her job. So suddenly, we were really, really out of money. Because in a way, we'd been uh, struggling, both of us, uh, but between the two of us, we were able to make it. But then came this first month when we couldn't pay the rent. And I realized, I need a job. I need a real job. So I uh, applied for a job as an art director in a web agency that was really nearby. And I wasn't really interested in doing websites. This was 95, I think. We were still doing the Netscape palette, if anybody rem remembers. So you only, only had 256 colors, which to me, coming from art school, was total rubbish. Uh, but then uh, I had this job just to make money, but uh, two things conspired to turn me into a manager. First one was that I had been running my pathetic little business in the cellar. So I was aware that I need to pay bills, I need customers, I need to keep the customers happy, and so on. Uh, I knew that I needed some planning and some organization to do uh, stuff. So that was one thing uh, that I had. Uh, I didn't think of it as an experience of running a business, but it was. And then the second thing that happened to me in this web agency was that I started working with people who were much more talented than I. So suddenly I had other artists and other engineers and other art directors who were better, and I thought they were much better than I was. So I was looking at their work and I was thinking, these guys are awesome, so why should I try to make websites? Because these guys are so much better. And then maybe I can just be you know, a helpful guy who is facilitating and you know, maybe making coffee or just being in the office and being generally nice. Uh, so those two things kind of put me in a position where I gravitated towards leadership. And in the beginning, to be honest, it was more like uh, being an assistant to the other art director and making sure that he didn't have to do the things that he hated doing, which was meeting customers or taking care of people or telling the engineers what they should be doing and so on. But before I knew it, I had uh, gotten a new title, head of production. I had 14 people working for me. And I think they were quite happy. So to my surprise, I suddenly was a manager, but I didn't really understand how it happened. Yep. PJ. I, I started in uh, 97. I was hired in, by Ubisoft by uh, one of the five brothers who started uh, the company. Um, Ubisoft was really, really disorganized at that time. Uh, my job desk uh, was, oh, yeah, sorry. Production at the time was done between Paris and Bucharest. We had a studio there in Romania. Um, and some of the projects uh, were fully done by faxes because we didn't have any emails. We had kind of an internal like, messenger that was built by one uh, genius there, uh, but then it was faxes. And so my job was mainly to maintain this fax uh, and to sometimes do stuff that my boss didn't like to do. So uh, production planning, but I had no idea about production and no idea about planning. So it was not really successful. Um, I had an idea on everything. I was probably too ambitious. So my boss decided to punish me, and uh, he asked me to take one project as a project manager, was the title. Um, and the project was Rayman 2 on Nintendo 64. It was the super powerful beast uh, of the time. You know, and there was a lot of RAM, and we were really happy. Um, so I worked with a super senior team there. Uh, Michel Ancel was the creative director. I worked with Serge Asquet, who's now the, our creative chief in Ubisoft. So it was easy for me to position myself low <laughs> and you know to just offer support and try to help when it was ne necessary and I think I, I learned probably from the best um, uh, yeah and this non bossy attitude is something that's very common with uh, Ubisoft uh, managers uh, I'm sure it's the culture of the CEO uh, he keeps telling us do not push somebody into something if they don't believe in you and if they don't believe in uh, what you want to do uh, it's going nowhere so uh, there's not the idea that you know there's a chain of command and orders coming Okay, um, so since those early days, we've both made a pretty long journey. So just to give you the baseline of where we are today, bore that, thank you. Uh, this is massive today. We are 271 people in the office, uh, a lot of people to take care of. 
Uh, we grow a lot, more than I would like to, because it's really difficult to grow and grow well with talent, so I would prefer that was slower, but just due to the nature of the projects we're working on, which are these large, super big AAA games that uh, uh, we talked about before, uh, we really do need a lot of people, and we need a lot of talented people. And that requires a lot of organization. Average age is now 31. Uh, of course, it's growing slowly. And the range is 21 to 57, but that's cheating because it's the receptionist who's 57. <laughs> the oldest person in development is, I I'm seen as a really old guy at Massive. I'm 46. Uh, so I guess the oldest person in development is around 39, something like that. And something that we're really proud of at Massive is that we've been able to recruit from all over the world with great success. And we've been uh, awarded a couple of times prizes for best multicultural workplace and best integration and so on. Uh, and I was asked once to, again, lecture to other people, you see there's a pattern here, uh, about what is it that you do uh, that is so fantastic? Uh, how do you integrate people? And the reality is we don't do anything at all. We are only interested in what people do and how well they do it. So nobody's typecast because they are from another country or from another religion or any gender or any type of preference. It's only a question of how good are you as a craftsman? So if you're a good craftsman, you're a massive employee 100% from day one. So you could say that's great integration, but the reality is that we don't even think about integration. We only think about uh, craftsmanship. Not very many women in Massive because we do Hollywood blockbuster games that traditionally don't attract so many female developers. And again, this number is cheating because everybody in HR and finance and in the office uh, are women. So I guess actually we only have like four women uh, who are in development. Growth always depends on project milestones. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, oh, my, my resume. Okay, shortly then. Uh, World in Conflict, this was uh, something we did after the ground control games. If you remember, in 2007, uh, piracy was really, really a big problem. It still is, but it was bigger then. And we had been niched uh, as a studio that could only do RTS games on PC. And there was not really a need uh, in the world anymore for that. If you remember other big RTS games like Age of Empires and Company of Heroes, they've all disappeared except uh, StarCraft. Uh, Ubisoft was the only publisher in the world who believed that we could evolve into something else uh, because we'd run out of money and we were talking to basically everybody and everybody said, ah, it's too bad, you're so nice and you're so good and this game is great, but you know, you're a PC RTS studio, nobody needs that. And we're like, oh, but please, 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 give us a chance, we can do other things, but nope. And then Ubisoft came along and they said, well, probably, you know, you're talented, you're smart, you know what you're doing, we think you can evolve into something else. And they gave us a chance to work on completely different titles like uh, that picture in the middle is from uh, Assassin's Creed Reve Revelations, where we did the coma parts of that game. Very arty and very strange. Uh, inspired a lot by David Lynch and Pink Floyd. And they were reviewed exactly like a David Lynch movie, which means that 70% of the people who played it hated it. <laughs> but the other 30%, they got it. And then, of course, more recently, we've been spending a lot of time on Far Cry 3. We worked on it uh, since it was conceived in the beginning together with Montreal, and we've been involved in really all parts of Far Cry 3. We had a big team on that, but most specifically, we did co-op, multiplayer, online, uh, and all of the social uh, parts of the game. And we're working on unannounced stuff. I'm not allowed to talk about that. Cool. Yeah, so I'll talk a bit about reflections. Uh, before this, I want to share something I read uh, last weekend. Um, I read a paper on a guy called Stewart Brandt. I had never heard about him. He's um, a kind of genius author from the 60s, and he wrote a book that was gigantic, like physically gigantic, uh, that was called The Whole Earth Catalog. And it's kind of prefiguring Google and the internet, and it was uh, 66. Um, so then I read, you know, like Steve Jobs, uh, it, it just admired this guy so much, and the guy in Wire decided to start Wire because of this. And uh, Stewart Brandt had a motto, and he said, stay hungry and stay foolish. And I was just reading this, and first I like it. <laughs> um, and I thought that it's really, um, it's, it's applied to, to Ubisoft. Um, I think we never forget that in the 90s, so when I was working on Rayman 2, for instance, the US retailers were really laughing at us. Like we could not, simply not push the boxes, um, they didn't want us. So we could sell a bit in France, we could sell in the EMEA. And this changed uh, with Tom Clancy and Splinter Cell. Um, so stay hungry, stay foolish. And my own way of staying hungry and foolish was uh, to uh, try to discover a bit the world. So I'm supposed to click. Um, so I traveled um, and was, yeah, was lucky enough to be able to work in a different studio in, in Ubisoft. And it made me realize that culture and a great fearless environment for people to express what they want to say um, 
the need is the same in India and in the US. It's exactly the same. It doesn't depend on the education. It doesn't depend on the, on the quality of the resources uh, or the cost. It's, uh, it's very important. So now I'm working in uh, Reflections. I just started six months ago. So I'm still really new here. Um, we have some facts here. So I think we beat Massive, at least with the oldest employee and the average age. Uh, we grew a lot uh, recently. We just hired uh, 65 people, actually, uh, in the past four months um, because uh, we're very heavily loaded on three big productions. So we work in collaboration with the uh, International Studio, which is very standard in Ubisoft. It's not always easy, but you learn a lot from international collaboration. When you um, create a game that requires 600 people, you can't find them in the same country. So it's really simple. We work internationally. So currently we work on Watch Dogs, and we work on Just Dance, and we work on something I'm not supposed to talk about, but I wish I could. Uh, it's going to be announced at E3. Um, so my takeaways. Um, I see my role not really as like an active role when I have to do stuff. I see my role mu much more at a symbolic level where uh, I give authorization to people to take risks. And so this can be translated in, uh, um, in my, I think it's my values that needs to show. So uh, my values are pretty simple. Um, it's about transparency, it's about speed, trust and embracing risk. And the way I'm trying to broadcast these values, it's by very simple things in a day. Like for instance, I, I'm trying to answer emails really, really quickly. And I don't mind if it's the super junior tester writing to me or if it's my general manager. I'm trying to be really, really fast. Um, I'm trying to make people understand that it's okay to fail. It's, it's fine. You, you should not fail too much, but if you fail once or twice, you know, it's okay. Um, I'm trying to show as well that the, the, the timeline, like the, the delays, the, the milestones, sorry, they're not as important as the quality. Uh, it's something that Ubisoft does well, is that we actually give the time to produce more quality. Um, and I'm trying to start experimentation when we're in a financial situation that is allowing us. Um, so this is because everybody loves experimentation, and that's, that's the way you can innovate. But you don't want to start this when you're financially not that comfortable. So uh, I consider that every dollar I make, I should reinvest in experimentation so that I, you know, I, I remain stable. Um, We're going to do a countdown? Yeah, countdown to three. <laughs> Yeah, I love the choice of pictures here. Uh, so yeah, it's okay to fail, I was saying. Uh, you're not alone, I see my jobs much more as um, uh, showing my studio that they're part of a community of uh, uh, you know, like expertise and that they're not alone and they're probably facing the same issues that somebody has faced in the past. So I'm trying to, to uh, anchor us inside a network. Uh, broadcast best practices, yeah. Ubisoft learned the hard way, I think, how to acquire a studio. Uh, we did not do it the, the, the right way in the past. And right now, the, the way I think Ubisoft does it is better is that it's about just sharing best practices. So we're not imposing an identity to a new studio. And I think Massive is clearly a good example of this. Uh, but it's about Ubisoft sharing their best practices and taking the best of the studio. Ubisoft doesn't exist, you know. Ubisoft head office is just, it's just a way to communicate and to pass on the best practices. The only value in Ubisoft is the studio. And maybe I'm going to get fired to say that head office has no value, but uh, <laughs> no, but it's, it's, I think it's really true. Smart move, Pauline. <laughs> no, but yeah, it's the, it's the games that counts. Um, yeah, so money is, is not a value. Uh, our CEO never, never talks about making money. He talks about creating the best game. And I'm, I'm sure he's worried about making money, but he's strong enough to actually not pass this worry. So it gives a lot of um, stability and comfort uh, for us to, to take risks. Information is power, uh, you mentioned it. It's absolutely power, so you need to share as much information as you can. And honestly, I would say the only thing I don't want to, to share is like the salary of my guys. You know, that's personal information. But apart from this, I want them to understand every context uh, within, in which the a decision is made. Um, yeah, last one. So I, I disagree with this. I think I'm very nice, but uh, I'm getting feedbacks, you know, in like anonymous 360 feedbacks and peer feedbacks that sometimes are scary. But I think it's okay if I'm a bit scary because maybe people are listening to me a bit more. I don't know. So. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Your three things. My countdown. Uh, so first of all, I still think of myself as uh, the guy who was 22 in art school, who doesn't understand what managers do, and I try to apply that filter to what I'm doing today because now I am a manager with 270 people. But I try to impress the 21-year-old uh, in myself. And I try to be 
uh, loyal to that person and that person's perspective by trying to do, uh, making sure that everything I do is actually directly meaningful for the team. And I want the guys on my team to say, but what David does is really helpful, actually. They don't have to like me, they don't have to say I'm a good boss, but at least I want them to go home and think, yeah, it's pretty helpful. You know, he removes roadblocks and he makes the office nice and we, he makes sure we have our, our tools available. So I'm trying to keep that perspective on what I do today. And uh, doing a countdown. Uh, number one, no, number three. Um, business versus craftsmanship. So with my background, of course, I'm interested in craftsmanship more than business. And the way I think of it is that Massive is a company that makes things. We're not a company that sells things. So I'm not really interested in uh, the selling part or the money part. I'm interested in the creation part. And that gives me a lot of ideas on how to run the company because it's not about power, it's not about structure, it's not about hierarchy, it's only about creation. And what I try to uh, express at Massive is that the only god we have is a project. It doesn't matter what anybody else says and it doesn't even matter what HQ says. You know, we have to be loyal to the project. The project has to be fantastic and then everything else has to align itself uh, after that. So I would say I'm trying to uh, organize Massive more like a guild than as a company. So there's really not a pyramid with traditional uh, layers and traditional titles. And in fact, titles can be really, really counterproductive because they give people the wrong idea of who they are and what they're doing in the company. So try to be careful with that. I have a bit uh, different uh, uh, perspective on this. Uh, I would not oppose business and craftsmanship. I would oppose craftsmanship and industry. And I think that's the big challenge we have today uh, with the next gen consoles coming on, is that uh, uh, how do you create the feeling of ownership uh, for everybody in a team out of 600 people, 700 people? How do you not make it a factory? And contrary to David, um, I don't believe in flat organization, I believe in flat communication, but I think a team of 700 needs to be absolutely well structured and you need to really understand uh, how the decisions are made. And it doesn't mean that, you know, like the lowest layer, let's say if it's really vertical, the lowest layer can talk with the boss. Uh, but um, if you don't structure your team of 700 guys, then it's, it, I think it's going to be a factory with, you know, one or two guys deciding. Um, but, uh, but I fully agree with you that we need to keep this craftsmanship and it's, it's very, very tough, the, the biggest the team. And on this one, I think uh, working internationally, even if it's sometimes very hard, it can help you keep a, a, a size of a team that's human, you know? It's, uh, it's not 700 guys in this huge garage. It's uh, a bit more manageable, I would say. And, it, and that's working too, uh, apparently. But I, I'm moving away from that. I'm going in the other direction. I have uh, officially proclaimed that Massive is a meritocracy. I'm sure you're uh, familiar with the word, but it's uh, an alternative to democracy or a dictatorship, maybe. Uh, where meritocracy means that uh, we're governed by uh, the best ideas, not by the most popular idea or not by the boss's idea. Uh, it's a great word and it really, really screws people up because it's very confusing. Uh, so I do have some of the problems that Pauline would suggest that it's a bit blurry and people don't understand all the time what's going on. Uh, and the way we try to protect our meritocratic environment is by having uh, another rule in the studio which is called always playable. And always playable is exactly that. It means that everything we're working on is always playable. So you can come to Massive any day and you can say, hey, what about that unannounced project? Here, you get the controller in your hand and you can play it. That's really great and it's fun and it's also a good way to focus a team, but it provides us with a test bed for which ideas are great. So I can sit in a meeting with my big title and my many years at Massive and say, I want this in the game. Fine, okay, it goes into the game, but the next day people are playing it and they think, fuck, this is really bad. Whose idea is this? Is this David's idea? Jesus, you know, it's really bad. So I lose my cred points. It's like an RPG, right? Uh, whereas the new guy, who is maybe young and maybe very shy, who says, ah, I, I have a small idea, okay, we try that in the game and it turns out to be fantastic, and automatically that person is given cred points. And of course the people who have the most power at Massive are the people who have been consistently delivering good things to the playable game over many years. Those are seen as the legends because always, uh, normally what they say is always good for the game. But does that mean that every single ID is going to be prototyped and, and produced to a certain level of quality? Or nope. how can you filter this? No, 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 it's a long discussion. But uh, no, it, you can't do it like that. No. So uh, there is, of course, a filter that is really a bit traditional where you have to convince the creative director to enter it into the game. But we're good at prototyping. So uh, that's probably why we, we can do this. And we can do really, really quick, crappy prototypes, but we have people who are experienced in evaluating them. Number two, drum roll. 
Uh, okay, so I didn't know what managers do. And I read a lot of books about what managers should do. And then ultimately I defined my own version of management. And this is the only rule I have. A manager's job is to set you up for success. If the manager is not setting you up for success, he's a bad manager. And vice versa. If I see my team failing, it's something that I'm not doing right. I can never blame the team. It's always something that I could do or should do or must do uh, to improve the odds. And everything I do at Massive, I approach with this rule. I have to be sure that what I'm doing is increasing the chance for the team to succeed. It's not about wielding power or about ego or about you know, owning information. It's really just about, is the team more successful like this or like that? And I even have a kind of a opposite rule for myself, which is if I don't know for sure, it makes the team better, I don't do it at all. Because there's a million things I could do as a manager. Uh, but I don't do them unless I'm sure it's for the be uh, best of the team. And, you know, we're asking people to do 90 plus games. Uh, that's easy to say. I need 92 on Metacritics, but it's enormously difficult to do. So we need, as managers, to put people in an environment that gives them a chance to do a 90 plus game. And that means everything has to be great. Like Pauline said before, answer emails quickly. Uh, make sure that the rules for entering and exiting the building are very, very simple, very, very straightforward, very practical. It allows people to work when they want to work. Make sure that there's breakfast in the building so people show up and that they're well fed, and so on and so on. There's just a million things you can do. So in art school terms, I would say that I define my job as a manager, as a person who's preparing the canvas. I'm not a painter in this job. Uh, I could be in my private time, but in this job, I'm just preparing the canvas. And if you know anything about oil painting, you know that the canvas is tremendously important. So that is a job that somebody needs to be very focused on. And somebody needs to believe that it's important. It's much more uh, flashy, maybe, and rock story to be the person who's doing the painting. But in this job, I'm doing the canvas, and I'm really, really liking it. My number one rule. This took me a long time to figure out, uh, because since I was uh, in the role kind of by accident, I thought that uh, I should be neutral. I should be very careful with what I said. I shouldn't have any op opinions. I shouldn't be subjective. But in the end, I've decided that that's not true. Uh, a good boss does have clear ideas about value and culture, and you should express them in the office. Uh, so I decided for Massive, and poor everybody's working there, uh, I said, at Massive, we have the value set of a hero. And everybody knows what that means. We're good, we're honest, we're brave, we're loyal, uh, we do the right thing. If we can help somebody, we will. We never bully anybody. There's no politics. Uh, no stuff about religion on the email threads, nothing. And the good thing with the hero value set is that everybody understands it. A kid understands it, but also, as you saw before, we have people from all over the world. So I don't want to discuss a value set that is very Swedish for some reason. I need a value set that works for everybody and that everybody instantly understands. So I've been saying, this is what I expect of you. As long as you're at Massive, you're in this office and you're wearing a Massive hoodie, I expect you to behave like heroes. I expect you to be fantastic and great. And then people can think I'm really silly or goofy and they can make fun of me and they can think that's a shit culture. But I decided that's the job I want to come to and that's the culture I want to have around me. And in fact, people are enjoying it a lot. We have almost no staff turnover at Massive. So I, I think it's a good thing. Uh, but I do think a lot of managers today that I meet, they're afraid to have an opinion. Uh, so they don't say anything in particular about the culture, about the values, and they don't interfere when they see bad behaviors in the office. And sometimes in the field that uh, uh they have to be part of the game content. They have to have ideas about the games. I don't think that's our position. It's, it's just about creating the, the canvas, like what you were saying, the frame. And, and you can have very strong and creative ideas when you talk about you know, uh, your office. It, it doesn't need necessarily to translate into the game. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, before we go to the failures part, which I'm sure you're looking forward to, um, I was told before coming here that there are a lot of uh, young people who are about to start their first company. Some of those people in Sweden would come to me and say, hey, David, you're successful. Tell me your uh, you know, top tips about being successful. Uh, it's always tricky to get a question like that because I don't think of myself as successful uh, in many ways. But I assume that if you're 21 and you're looking at the job I have and the games we're making, it looks like it's a pretty successful journey. Uh, so I have three things I say to these people. Number one, dum -da -da -dum, never burn any bridge. Simple enough. Uh, you never know who you may need and when. 
And I made the mistake when I was in art school to be a bit arrogant and there were some people there that I didn't like and I was bullshitting them and you know, I wasn't really doing the right thing. I wasn't a hero. And afterwards I regretted it a lot, not because I really needed them, because I thought it's so stupid of me to burn that bridge. Because it would have been so much better for my karma, if nothing else, to have been you know, a good person. And then uh, many things in my life seem to have happened by accident. All the good things to me seem to be pure luck. But I can also trace many of them to the fact that I try to be nice, I try to be polite, I try to help people. When people ask me for a favor, I try to say yes, if I can. And I do it without, uh, uh, how do I say, without any thought of getting anything back. I just invest in people, in network. And it's been a tremendous asset to me in my business life. So that's uh, something I would really, really recommend. Second one, information really is power. Pauline touched upon this. Uh, first of all, Smart people think a lot, and we work with smart people in this industry, and they think a lot. So they want to have information. They really, really need to know what's happening. Uh, and they need to know everything for some reason. Like, uh, for a while, I, I do uh, weekly morning meetings as massive for the whole company, 10 minutes. I just tell people what's going on. And still people will come to me and say, but I have no information. I said, but we have the email lists, we have the newsletter, we have the mass TV in the kitchen, I do the morning meetings. We do the six monthly company. What is it that you want to know? And they say, well, for instance, I don't know what guns they're going to use in the next Far Cry. I say, ah, OK. So that's what people will need to know. Ah, oh, cool. And you know, I don't, know, don't know how the audio for that particular weapon was done. Ah, OK. So it was on a very, very fine detail. People want to know everything. So we changed the way we do the morning meetings into being very, very focused on small features. But when people gradually accumulate all of this knowledge, they feel more powerful. For myself, I like to read and I like to know uh, what I'm talking about. So I have a tendency to read when people say, hey, you should check out that book. I'm the guy who actually reads it. Or when somebody says, oh, we're going to meet this company. I like to do the research on the company. I don't always do my homework. But many, many times I've been in business meetings where I realize I'm the only one who has all the information because I studied and because I spent two hours on thinking about the meeting instead of just coming here assuming that I know. And it's many, many times been the best business advantage I've ever had, just because I know what's happening in the room. And then finally, personal advice. This is super personal, but um, I spent too much time in my life being afraid. And there are a lot of things to be afraid of, uh, especially uh, if you're doing AAA games. You're talking about uh, enormous budgets and enormous spectacular failures. And you can be afraid of bad press, you can be afraid of uh, losing the uh, uh, loyalty from your dev team or by HQ not liking it. There's so many, many things you can be afraid of. And unfortunately, I was insecure and afraid uh, too much in my life. But imagine that I had uh, a friend, uh, another David, who was standing here next to me. And you could hear all throughout this presentation that he's telling me, David, you're losing the audience. They really don't like it. It's not interesting. Why are you doing this? Et cetera, et cetera. You would all be, it would be easy for you to spot that guy and say, that's not a good friend. What the hell is he doing? You know, he's not helping me. And even if he's right, even if I am losing you, it's still not helping me. And when I kind of observed that pattern in my own head, I just said, you know what, shut up. I can't listen to this voice. I'm just going to pretend that fear doesn't exist. And I'm going to make every decision as if I can't lose anything. And since I made that decision, I've been much, much more successful uh, in my business life. And I think this in particular is a business where you need to take risk and you need to take some very, very bold risks without worrying too much about what's going to happen. So um, the lack of fear, does it mean that sometimes you simply fail because you don't look at the right things? So ah, failures, yes. Um, yes, I fail too often, but I fail less now that I'm not trying to be afraid. So what I, I, I wish I had a very, very funny failure now that would make you all laugh, uh, some John Cleese-inspired event. Uh, I, is there anybody from NVIDIA here? NVIDIA? Phil? Phil? No? <laughs> I was in a bar once with uh, Phil and Phil, and we had ox testicles, a uh, very weird place. And it was so f scary that we decided that we had to drink. And I ended up uh, sleeping on a carpet with a turtle as a pillow. Uh, but that, that wasn't really <laughs> a failure because it was a really, really good business meeting and we became good friends after that. And I remember another time when I was asked to do a presentation on German television uh, for a, an award, an eSports award, 
And I thought, yeah, cool, German television, no problem. And I got the envelope of the winner, and I was looking at it, and it was this impossibly strange Polish name. And I was like in live TV trying to say, I completely botched it. But that was a failure, but that was a small failure. Uh, my biggest failure is just sad and confusing and very, very costly. It cost uh, my company a lot of money. And it goes back to the rule I had before, which is a manager's job is to set you up for success. It sounds great, and I really believe that. But at one point, I was working with a really senior guy, and to him, that was an invitation to be lazy. He said, well, apparently David is doing all the job. Yeah, it's great, then I can just goof around and do whatever I like. And what did I think? Well, I thought, shit, it's not working. I need to fix it. I need to work harder because it's my job to set him up for success. So I just did more and more and more, and he did less and less and less. And in the end, I wasn't on the team. I was still just a managing director. So I was trying to help him, but the result was that I was creating a, a cover-up. I was covering the fact that this person was not doing his job. So I became uh, the creator of a big lie, and the whole team lost around a year, and they became incredibly bitter and disappointed with what we did that year. And I realized in hindsight that, shit, that was my fault, really. Uh, I should have seen that, and I should have treated it completely differently. But that's a very expensive mistake I did, so uh, yeah. even though we're talking here about advice, uh, it's not all good advice. Yeah, my, my failure would be uh, very much related to uh, seeing a team losing trust. I think that's what is hurting the most. Probably because it's uh, not our own money too, when we lose millions. Uh, but um, I had a bit the same, uh, like similar experience about five years ago. Uh, I was working with a small team to do a musical game. It was on the Wii, just when the Wii was really, you know, like before the peak. Um, and we decided to do a kind of a mashup game. So we had this great prototype, and you would, you know, take the sounds and launch them. And we were in deals uh, with a really great track, uh, like a um, music recording company. Uh, and so I wanted to do everything perfectly, so I wanted to respect all the processes, so I made sure that our you know, chief creative officer was really involved and that everybody was involved, I would follow exactly our internal uh, development process. And I think I was probably just uh, uh, scared of, of not doing it right. Uh, and so we did this for two years, um, so we lost some millions, I would say, and, and the game was cancelled. And at the same time, what's really interesting is that um, a small team was working in a Paris studio on a kind of dancing prototype, so that's like five, six years ago, uh, that, is, that, that would become Just Dance. But at that time, just, just a mechanic from uh, the Rabbids game. And you know, in, in, in Playtest, everybody loved it. So they decided to try to do something. And it was totally unofficial, under the radar. And they decided to not follow the internal processes. So it was a team of, honestly, 10 guys, like in a garage, doing their own thing because they believed in it. And massive success, like almost 40 million copies, when I did the right thing and I didn't I think they were right. So what it means to me is that um, um, when, when you want to do things for yourself and not for success and not for your boss, or if you failed and you want to prove everybody wrong, you want to show uh, what you're capable of, that's, that's the right attitude. Like this underdog kind of, uh, uh, you know, under the radar way of doing things. So I'm not saying that processes are worthless. It's just that most of the time it's okay. But if you get the right attitude and you, you actually are yeah, pushing your limits, you can, you can get, um, bring a lot of success. And I have a few examples of this. Just Dance, I was saying, 10 guys in a garage, uh, 40 million copies sold. It's, it's not 10 guys anymore. It's, not, it's a big machine, but it's not like this. Far Cry is interesting too. Far Cry 3 um, was a bit unknown by Ubisoft until the very last months. Uh, David, who worked on Far Cry 3, was telling me that in the Six months before the release, you played, and suddenly you, you, you knew that it was really a jam. It was the first time I, I picked up the game, and I realized it was good. Yeah. But we'd been working on it a long time when it wasn't good. So I, I clearly remember, um, you know, Far Cry 2 was a, a brilliant game, but it was not the masterpiece that we were waiting for. And then for three years, four years, Far Cry 3 was in development, and we didn't really... Uh, there was not that much trust into the team to bring something that would be uh, absolutely great. And everybody was shocked by the reviews. Like, honestly, like nobody had anticipated it. I'm sure that guys in headquarters were probably anticipating it, but I was really, really surprised. No, it was us. I think nobody was expecting it. So. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the last example is interesting, too. It's um, the former core team of Far Cry 2 um, were very disappointed about the results, you know? They had, like, a, really a masterpiece, but technical reasons made it limited, I would say. Um, so the commercial success was okay, but not great. And um, like part of this core team decided to work on something that would be really new. 
and they came up with what is now Watch Dogs. It started differently, you know, it took, uh, it took uh, months of development. But uh, I'm sure there is something that is a bit uh, like a revenge, not revenge against something, but um, revenge because you want to prove yourself that you're actually worth uh, a lot more than what you showed in the past. Uh, I think it shows. Uh, we can watch the Watch Dogs trailer. It's cool. <laughs> Because uh, this gets, if you're on the lower level, this gets chucked at you. Health and safety dictate that if you're on the upper level, I'm afraid it, uh, it's, it's a microphone. So um, I'll, I'll, if you could take the questions and I'll, I'll hurl this at anybody. Has anybody got any questions? Because you're closer. Nice. Great shot, thank you. Yeah. Um, you both said information is, is really key and really important to the process of what you do. What was the most important or influential piece of information you ever received? That I have ever seen? Uh, that you've ever received? Received. Yes. So which, which piece of information would you um, say was the most influential? Yeah, so I... That I was I going to become a father, probably. But that's not <laughs> what you're asking, I guess. Oh, this kind of information. Oh, I don't think that's what you meant. Um, yeah, I have like two memories. The first one is uh, I'm working on Rayman 2 and the project manager there. Nintendo 64 gets uh, cartridges that have different RAM inside. There's the whatever, 128 and 256, and, and so, and our game is 3D, and the textures are like hand-drawn, it's high quality. Um, so it makes sense for me to get the biggest RAM, just because it's easy and we can just, you know. And I remember we were beta, and the CEO, Eve, told me that it was more costly for the company, and I had not even the idea that we would pay for the cartridges. I was 22, but, um, so suddenly I understood that, you know, constraints are not just your, your tech and production constraints, but like business constraints are important. Uh, and a bit similarly, I would say, um, I remember understanding, yeah, again, financial information, uh, understanding how much a studio was making after, you know, like that and after the retailer and after what Ubisoft needs to pay and et cetera. And this, I think, allowed me to get more ownership of what I was doing. Um, it's you make decisions with the right context and the right lights and you, maybe you, yeah, you think more for the company rather than just for your own ego. I think there's always a lot of sensitive information uh, that we have access to. Uh, but the coolest thing I saw recently was the uh, intel on the games lineup for 2014 and 15 from all the publishers. And when I saw that, I thought, wow, this is going to be the golden age of uh, computer gaming and video gaming. So uh, just brace yourself. There's going to be some really, really good years coming up. Fantastic. Right. Oh, do you, oh, Great, perfect. Hi. <coughs> um, like we're seeing in the moment a lot of devs breaking off from AAA studios and forming independent studios because the, the, of the pressures of blockbuster development sort of gets to them so much and they want to go off and have greater control over the projects. Um, do you think that that's going to actually increase? That we're going to see more of that going to next gen as the sort of budgets go up and as the pressure of things like Metacritic and, and deadlines and such start to increase? I, I missed the first part. See more of what? Uh, m more of um, developers branching away from like AAA studios and setting oh. up shop on their own because they want more control or maybe the pressures mm -hmm. are too great. Or 
Wow, that's a difficult question. Do you have a... Yeah, I'm not sure I understood fully. You mean like a, a like small studio decided to partner with bigger publisher? No, like no? people working for AAA studios just maybe for getting too fed up of, of, of not having enough control or say in the overall. Yeah, so um, um, it's, it's, it's a very big challenge. I was mentioning it going next gen with the, these huge teams. How do you still feel that you're part, that you have an impact on the game? Um, so I think there are some organizational ways of doing this, of making this happen. You can actually break down the scope of your game into scopes that are like smaller, but then you, get, you give full ownership to a team in charge of this. And the way they work is organic, the way we were doing games 20 years ago. So it's one big structure that's got multiple small organic structures, something that, uh, that uh, we deployed in Ubisoft. I think it's working really well. Um, is this what you yeah, pretty meant? Much yeah. yeah. And then, um, um, yeah. Oh, it's a little, a little bit else? like what you said in the introduction, that there's room for a whole, a much longer scale, a much more chromatic scale of types of games and types of developers. Uh, and I think that space is almost empty today, apart from some very good examples. But uh, there should be a lot of room you know, below the, the monster games. And I think we will see fewer monster games all in all. Like the movie industry, uh, they don't make too many because they'll just cannibalize on themselves. Yeah. So I think uh, big publishing is going in that direction, fewer, bigger. And then there's a lot of space uh, between that and the one-man company. So a lot more sort of mid to sort of... Mid-level mid sort of to, to indie sort of games coming out, filling up the gaps. Right? Yeah, the problem becomes when you need venture capital to finance what you're doing, that's when you go into a completely different type of business. As long as you can finance it yourself up to 7 or 30 or 60 or 80, uh, you can do uh, a lot of things. And you were mentioning you know, um, uh, people may be tired of not having control and creative control of what they do just because they're diluted in these huge teams. So we changed our internal rules a few years ago, I think maybe two or three years ago. So uh, when you work in Ubisoft, if you want to create your own self-published title, you can. Uh, it needs to be limited in amount, you know, you can't make uh, 10 times what you're making with Ubisoft, so we limit this, but it's still allowing for another pace, you know, like more agility and, and work with two or three people, and of course we can, you know, have the office for this and we can uh, uh, offer some support into this. And if the guys want to pitch this back to Ubisoft because they want financing and they want uh, it to be published, it's, it's an option as well. Fantastic. Do you want to just pass it back, Capital, to Oscar? I think it would be the last question because it's yeah. just... Oh, right. oh okay. okay. Yeah, we, we better... Yes, yeah, sorry, yeah. we better, better make this the last question. Okay, so uh, I just want to carry on that theme a little bit. It's Oscar Clark here from Amplify. And what, I think a lot of what you said is great, sensible management stuff, but I wonder how much of it is still relevant to indie developers to the extent that we were saying. What I worry about most is I don't hear a great deal of the way that you're f taking feedback from the audience. And I think one of the biggest disruptions we've seen particularly in the mobile and tablet space, is this move towards games as a service. And I think part of the process fundamentally changes management style. And it's all about understanding and maintaining an audience, not just about managing and maintaining the, the creativity of the team. You need both, of course. But what do you, so turning it into question is, what advice do you think is still relevant to the indie teams? Huh. Yeah. Um. So we're not a business school. Um, I think that all the things I said are relevant to any company that is large enough. And I, I don't think those ideas are bad for a company that is producing milk or cars either. I think they're good, good ideas. But it's related to the size. Uh, and there's a lot of research about this that shows that human groups behave very different, differently depending on size. And I think the type of management that we've been discussing today is not really relevant until the group is over 120 people. Uh, so be below that, you can choose completely different patterns. Um, absolutely. There's a guy called uh, Dunbar, I believe he's British, uh, has a theory called Dunbar's number that you uh, should look, at, look into. It describes the differences between the different stages. That was one question, right? Yeah. Did you have two? questions in what I talk about but uh, I mean the, the, I think my problem is that I get what you're saying but I wonder how many companies will still be able to manage at the scale you're at and how many other companies will be having to take completely different management styles because we're dealing in worlds which are so dramatically changing so fast. So we, we had a seminar just a month ago David and myself like with the, all the, the head of production gathering um, it's, it's something that we, we are all very worried about, is that we would lose our culture and identity because we move from a product to a service, uh, because it means Facebook, it means Zynga, it means another type of culture. Um, so um, it's, it's our challenge right now is to make sure that we keep the, 
this healthy you know, basis of culture and make sure that we can incorporate the customers, talk to them directly and you know, like, like be CRM in our own way. Um, and uh, yeah, and if we don't do this, probably we would lose a bit of what makes Ubisoft uh, a good company. So uh, we need to be very careful. So yeah, I understand your question. I think that's, that's really the yeah. point of why I'm asking, because I think games as a service is the most profound change, not just premium. And I think what we do about that to stop the industry sort of collapsing in on itself is going to be very interesting over the next few years. Uh, it's, a, it's a really complicated challenge. I agree with Pauline. It's, uh, it's not all good. I, w I would normally think it's great. The, more, the closer you are to your gamers and the consumers, the better. And then you can make a good game together, like uh, Minecraft. Uh, but it's also challenging because not everybody is a great storyteller. So when you try to make your de design choices based on popularity, it's not necessarily uh, a good story anymore. So, so it's, it's a little bit more complex than... Uh, my, my instinct was to just embrace it and say, oh, great, we'll be close to our gamers, wonderful, and we can have fun. But I realized that it's a bit more complicated than the, you... Yeah. Uh, as I said, not everybody is suited to be a game designer, and game design by popularity is a really bad idea, actually. And it's a lot of change uh, in the dynamics between the business, the, the business, the digital marketing and production teams. You know, uh, when your game is live, What's marketing? What production? Where is the, the frontier? So it's, uh, so it's something that we, we are discussing right now really heavily. Again, there was this, um, this uh, seminar last month. Uh, it's, it's very important because we're all going to reposition ourselves. But uh, it's, it's interesting and we can't miss this. You know, we can't just pretend that it's not existing. So we need to keep the best and, uh, and maybe help change the way this industry has been working. You know, free-to-play in, uh, industry has been working as well. We maybe have our part to play in this. That's why I'm writing all right. Yeah. Mm. It's great. Cool. Lovely. Thanks. Well, thank you so much. That was really fascinating. It's very refreshing to hear that actually you have quite different views, but it still works <laughs> yeah. very well yeah, within me a lot. the same. She me a lot on culture, so, uh, yeah. No, that's great. No, and, and I have to say, I mean, contrary to Oscar, I think a lot of what you're talking about really does apply to the smaller teams of like 15, 20 people. Um, that was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.